like a hands-on workshop. Uh, we would like to start our uh, conference today with a welcome message by Professor Cherian. He's the director of the Noble Institute of Neurosciences in the Noble Medical College and Teaching Hospital, Biratnagar. Professor Cherian, please come and welcome. Am I audible? It's so good to see all of you. All my friends from all over the world, Brazil, Oxford, China, India, Pakistan, India again, huh? You know, when we started, when the seats started for this conference, we didn't want to do a pure neurosurgical conference. One of the things in uh, neurosurgery, that is killing neurosurgery, is uh, boundaries. You would figure out when, that, when you go into super specialities, you'll figure out what I mean. We wanted something without boundaries. Absolutely no boundaries. So imagine medical students learning neurosurgery. Neurosurgery is supposed to be a hallowed branch. Medical students coming and learning neurosurgery, having their opinions in neurosurgery. That's the beginning. That's how we thought we'll start. Now, instead of talking about neurosurgery, I would want to talk to you about two cardinal so-called sins. There are, in my belief, there are no sins, actually. But the so-called sins, two cardinal sins, you know, in neurosurgery. One is fear, two is shame, both uh, interdependent. That's why a lot of uh, problems happen in neurosurgery. I think it's the same in any other branch, but I'm not expert enough to tell you. But in neurosurgery, I can tell you fear and shame. And then there is a small thing, which is partly fear, partly shame, and that is ego. Okay. These things, these three things can kill you in neurosurgery. And killing doesn't mean anything. It makes you mediocre. You know? I believe that life is not worth living a day if, if you tend to be mediocre. You should either be a grand success or a grand failure. Okay. There's no point being mediocre. So we were not created for being mediocre. Just uh, be born, live 60 years as a nobody and as an average who doesn't contribute, who doesn't love, huh? who doesn't do good surgeries, who doesn't do hair raising adventures, and then, you know, go to the grave. That's not what we are created for. So the whole point of this conference would be for you to understand what are the horizons of neurosurgery, what are the basics of neurosurgery, and then for you to understand that how you can overcome fear, shame, and ego. In Sanskrit, say, they say, nirlajjam sarvam sukhi. Those without lajja. What is lajja? Shame. Those without shame, you know, they are always happy. You know, in uh, Hindu philosophy, who is the god without shame? Who's the god with no shame? Always dances, smokes, pot. Shiva. Okay. He's always happy. In neurosurgery, unfortunately, you see the next guy, what he's doing, he's doing financially good or if he's doing good surgeries, there's always shame. And then envy comes out of shame. Okay. And after envy comes anger. Then comes hate. And that guy becomes your zone enemy. So anybody who goes above average becomes a sworn enemy of all the averages. Right? That happens. You cannot fight that with hate. Hate can never. It's over 10,000 years that civilization is trying to discover year after year that hate cannot be fought with hate. All right? 
hate can be only fought with love. Right. The second thing is shame. To ask a question. There's a, there's a master. But you don't want to ask a question because you feel that, you know, they might think that you're not good. If in your mind you understand you're not good and you need to learn, you become a student. And if you're not a student till the day you die, you're never going to do good neurosurgery. So these are the things as far as medical students, as far as the young generation, you are concerned, you, you need to be doing this. Otherwise, unfortunately, you know what neurosurgery has come to? Neurosurgery has come to a bunch of retards writing papers. Frankly, I'm not saying writing papers is bad, but I always ask this question. I asked this in Nipples and the people were wondering what I was asking about. How many papers did Lionel Messi or Ronaldo write about football? They're professional footballers. How many papers did Schumacher write on racing? We are as skilled or we are expected to be more skilled than them. But unfortunately, the skill part of neurosurgery has died away. Any Tom, Dick and Harry can do the surgeries that people are doing right now because there's no skill involved, it's just writing. And after writing, you set a p-value and you say that this operation is dangerous. So let's coil. And after some time, coiling is dangerous. Let's watch, I'm sure. I'm, 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 I can tell you there are papers like this now. Wait and watch. So I agree. Sometimes, sometimes wait and watch is not a bad policy, but the skill levels of people are going down. So as a new generation, what I want you to do is you should push limits. Have you seen the, the card tricks guy? Have you seen what skills they have with their hands? That's what, I mean, that's what you should begin with. You're a neurosurgeon. You're not a card trick guy. You, you need to be saving lives. So your skills. And can you imagine Virat Kohli not practicing in the nets before a test? Or, uh, or Ronaldo or Lionel Messi met, met, missing his practice sessions? No, they're masters, yet they practice. These things are now not anymore seen in neurosurgery. They think, I'm master, I don't need to practice. It's not correct. Okay? So, you guys should push the limits of acquiring skills. Learn to make a stitch. Learn to do anastomosis. Learn to drill everything in the right way. And of course, one more thing. Everything in life needs a coach. You want to play table tennis? You want to play football? You need a coach. Okay? A coach is maybe a lesser player than you. Malong is a, I mean, is a table tennis player, he's a master. He's world number one, but he has a coach. The coach may not beat Malong in a game, but the coach will tell you what he's doing wrong. You need a coach, right? So all of us are here. We necessarily are not better than you, but we can tell you the right, we can point you in the right directions because we've had many failures going in the wrong directions. So, welcome to Birat Nagar. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cherian. That was a motivational talk. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Igor Lima Maldonado. He is a professor at the Federal University of Bahia, Brazil, currently working at the University of Tours, France. He'll be giving a talk on intrinsic cerebral anatomy. Sir. Good morning, everybody. IPE is really a pleasure. 
It's a wonderful pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. It's all a pleasure, always a pleasure to come to Nepal. I was looking uh, through the window in the airplane uh, between uh, Kathmandu and uh, Gurichanagar. What a spectacular country. Congratulations. So um, our first topic will be about intrinsic cerebral anatomy. So that's the second reason for me to thanks IPE. Thanks for uh, putting this uh, 30 minutes on uh, cerebral anatomy, which is uh, also important. <laughs> it's, um, it's important even for uh, when you are performing uh, pericerebral surgery, but it is fundamental for uh, brain surgery, right? So I try to focus on what are the most important things and uh, some of functional neuroanatomy. Uh, I split this presentation in two parts. The first one will be on the superficial anatomy and the eloquent areas. And the second part will be on deep anatomy. So, sure. Sure. <laughs> Guys, you probably don't know Igor. Igor is a world-known expert on uh, neurosurgical anatomy. He's part of the WFN's anatomy committee, okay? He teaches anatomy to the whole world, all right? And he's one of the most revered teachers, okay? He, he, look, he does look, look young. He's not very young, actually, but he does look young. <laughs> Igor is from Brazil, and he's one of the most uh, favorite teachers in uh, all the courses. You will figure out very soon why. You're very kind. Oh, perfect. So, as you're talking, we need to go to the wall. And can you just give a more or less the composition of the wall? How many of you were making this? How many of you are first faculty? More than four? More than four? How many of you are residents? So, the first thing you're talking about? So the first thing is this. Uh, let me stress a very simple question. Number one, how many cubicle rooms do we have? I heard four. I learned. That first thing you learned with this error. Five. Six, four, six. In the first place, you say four. Uh, you know, there are different classifications. You can say five and six. Six actions that have the uh, 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 music. Sulci or the lateral, also called the sulcus of Julius, Sylvius Fisher, and the central. Right? Actually, sulcus and Fisher is not really the same, really the same thing, but I'm not going to explain this in detail. But why are we using this two sulci to separate both Are they different from the other? If you were an anatomy, and try to separate the functional things and other things, right? Probably you will see something that's going to be different. So 
reason why we're calling this orbital, triangular, and of circular is force of the universal surface. And what does a um, broadcast area do? Broadcast area is the uh, variable, very variable, but it's the posterior half of this triangular portion and the whole We have a speck of certain important language area to that one. This is the project of the So once again, let's use two science diagram. So this temporal lobe, postural secretion portions of temporal lobe. This is lateral sulcal, oh, I'm sorry, superior temporal sulcal, right? And this is inferior temporal sulcal, which is the most of the posterior third of the superior temporal circle also um, extending to the cortex inside, I'm sorry, the posterior third of the superior temporal gyrus extending to the cortex inside the circle to the border of the middle of the gyrus for the It means that most of our fundamental when I read something, I recognize this is language, and then I have to interpret this is a release to this. This area is important. Right? Uh, of course, we can use a uh, stone size diagram for that, but keep in mind that those elevator diagrams are very important. There was a lot of um, There is also one last
okay. So, with all those areas, you can try your uh, skills and math from the areas in your head. So, those are the most important ones, they're not the only ones, but you see primary motor cortex, sensory cortex, supplemental motor area, which are also a little bit represented in the lateral aspect. And also, as I said, primary motor cortex. So this is a, what we call nowadays a local, local motion. But probably you're going to um, agree with me. This area is that they are thinking if they are not connected to each other. Does it make sense? Not very. Let, let, let me explain. If I have, for example, uh, a piece of wood, they turn on back. Okay. If I have my most primary motor. So, in order to better understand how all that is working, this is first of all how those different areas are working. So, I don't, I will not go through it in all the details, but. of white matter fascicles. What is that? Take a look at this brain. It was prepared for this dissection, what we call clinical dissection. This is with the cortical layer. This is without the cortical layer. And take a look that at the level of each structure, you have a subcortical layer of a very which is moved at the level of the depth of the stone, so forth, but grows at the top of the gyro. And if you zoom it a little bit, you understand why. Is that the depth of the stone is covered by a huge number of short associated fibers that are connected to the root. And when you take those fibers out, you get inside what we call the central nucleus, which is made of a lot of branches going from one meter to the other of this, what we call the central nucleus, going from one hemisphere to the other, what we call the central branch, but the biggest right? And also going linking different Some examples of deep structure. This is part of this, what's called hero functional fascicles. This is arcuate fascicles. Let me just remind a little bit of this. Some minutes ago, I was here telling you about the block and the right? And then I talked about the vernicate. So, vernicate is
taking this information here and injecting the partial information. I have a two here. But I have a strong. I can have block as area inside. Burning as area inside. But my patient still has numbers. Just to finish, how we are the to work on uh, In this case, as a strong pair, and a strong pair, you are really saying that this patient has all the magnum and all the things he needs to speak, right? And probably this patient is able to understand what the burning area is. But in this, in this the main clean communication here is that the guy has difficulty to reduce what it is. This guy has difficulty for it using phone. For example, if I have a non broken area, our face of this would be inside and burn the case area by then. I can see that I probably have under this and see my external brain. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Iger. We now have uh, Dr. Sanjeeva Jayaratna. He is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Oxford University Hospital. He will be giving a talk on uh, surgical corridors in skull based surgery. I would like to request the medical students to take part in interactive sessions so that it's, it's both sides, okay? Sanjeev is from uh, Oxford. I met him in uh, Malaysia and uh, he was uh, leading the skull base workshop along with me, uh, the WFNS skull base workshop along with me. So it's a real pleasure to have him here. Huh? We are honored, Sanjeev. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank, thank you for the invitation. I just get my laptop. Good. Right. Can I use the handheld mic? No. Okay. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I thank you very much for this invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here in Nepal. Uh, the, what we've seen so far has been fantastic, and I'm sure the, the coming days will be great. So that's, thank you for the kind invitation to be here. So my understanding is that most of you are medical students. Is that fair? Yes? Good. Okay. So surgical corridors and skull-based surgery probably for you isn't the most relevant thing at the moment, but this is about the principles of how we approach patients. Skull-based surgery is, is one of the more complex bits of neurosurgery, uh, although you could say all bits of neurosurgery are complex. And, and this is about the decision making and, and how we move forward uh, when we have a patient in front of us. I think you were going to have a talk from, from IPA where, where we've moved ahead uh, explaining some of the bits of the base of the skull, but I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. We're, we're talking about the area where the brain rests, which is divided into three parts. Can I have a pointer, please? Um, no, don't worry, don't worry. And it's divided into three parts. You see the picture, picture on, my, on my left. You have the, the anterior fossa, the middle fossa and the posterior fossa. Now I know a lot of you may not have covered this anatomy yet, but, but don't worry. The point here is that most of the cranial nerves coming out of the brain are going to go through that part of the skull. There are major blood vessels involved, the carotid artery, the branches of it, the, the basilar artery are all part of the skull base and are important when we operate in that area. And there are large venous channels that in some way are more challenging if you get a problem with than arteries when you operate in this area. So my point is that skull base surgery is challenging and how you approach that is very important. I know a lot of you may not be familiar with MRI scans at the moment, but these are just some of the, some of the problems. This doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't may not show as clearly up there, but I'm showing a sort of uh, a, a pituitary lesion there, large tumors. This is an MRI scan, uh, a flat slice through the brain. And the point is that it's a very large tumor pushing on the brain stem. As you can imagine, as you will learn in the coming years, there are a lot of cranial nerves in that area and safely removing this tumor, not damaging the nerves of the brain is very important. You know what that part of the brain is called? Any ideas? It's called the cavernous sinus. Who's in the later, who's done anatomy already? What cranial nerves go through the cavernous sinus? Sorry? Yeah, very good. And, and if you, what you want to be able to do is to go in there. Anybody can just rip something out. You want to be able to go in there, remove the tumor. The patient should not have any new cranial nerve palsy. If anything, they should be better following the operation, and that is, that is the skill, and that is the point, and how you decide when you operate, if you operate, uh, and that is the point of what we're gonna talk about. Um, this is another sort of large lesion uh, involving it. Uh, here's another thing, you know, this is involving all, this is the tumor, and it's involving all of the central cell base, and again, these tumors are very resectable safely, uh, and it's about how you go ahead and approach these sorts of lesions, okay? So, these are some of the points. Thank you. These are some of the points about how, how you go ahead and, 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 and pick what you're going to do. And, and Professor Sherian started to, to, to talk a little bit about that. I know it's a little bit abstract for you all at the moment because you're not, you, you know, you're, you haven't started uh, making these yourself, but you will very soon. But picking the right patient is important. So patients who, uh, well, you know, you, some of you are clinical, some of you are clinical here, is that right? Can you give me an example of a patient you would not operate on? Well, you guys operate on everybody, good, very good. Yeah, so quality of life, that's a, that's a very good point. If we feel we are, sorry, if we feel we are unable to recover their quality of life, that's a good point. So in England, we're very keen on not being ageist, so the age alone wouldn't matter, so we would operate on patients in their 80s, 90s. Uh, 
but how well they are for anesthesia does matter. For example, so you want to do a heroic 10 hour surgery, they're not going to come through it. You know, there's, there's, there's no point in doing that. Okay, so patient selection is key. And actually, uh, it, it, we've moved a little bit forward in England, partly because of the law, uh, in, in something called the Montgomery ruling that went to our courts, that actually what the patient wants is really, really important. So you heard a very good talk earlier about important parts of the brain and somebody who is a, well, let's use, let's use examples that I've used earlier. You know, if you had Lionel Messi or you had Schumacher, unfortunately he's obviously very unwell now, but if you had a world-class piano player who may not want to risk their ability to continue those things, that's all very important. The patient selection is key for us in who we pick and, and when we operate or not. You're going to hear a lot about anatomy in the next two days. You heard it, you had a great talk earlier. That is absolutely critical. You should not be operating on anybody unless you really, really understand the anatomy. And actually, you're coming to the point, a lot of you in your first couple of years, where you're going to be spending a lot of time doing dissection. And I would really take this opportunity to learn the anatomy well. It will serve you very well, whatever your careers are going to be in neurosurgery or not. Some of these things I'm going to talk about a little bit, but maybe a little bit more abstract at, at your stage. But in any operation or anything you, not just in any operation, in any patient you approach, you need to break down what you're going to do into clear steps of how you're going to go ahead and do something. So when I decide if I'm going to operate on this, I have to be very clear in my head about everything on, have I picked the right patient? Do I understand the anatomy of what I'm going to do? How am I gonna have the patient in the operating room? What sort of anesthesia? Do I understand all of these things going ahead? And that's the same for you, even if you're not going to be a neurosurgeon, I would strongly advise having a very systematic approach to everything you do. This is the more neurosurgery part of it, and again, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but this is again about the principles. So you don't have to operate on everybody. Radiotherapy is a good option in the right patient. Not operating is a good option in the right patient. And it is about selecting each of those. So we, we discussed some of the reasons why we may not operate and may want to pick those approaches. Neurosurgery has changed dramatically uh, in skull based surgery, certainly over the last 10 years, uh, where we do a lot of things endoscopic now. Uh, a lot of it transnasally or even uh, small approaches of putting the endoscope in. Uh, and that's very good, but again, it's all about picking, it's about picking the right patient and the right pathology. Uh, and that's something for those of you who go on to do neurosurgery, I'm sure we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, be looking at it in more detail. So just to get you thinking about some of these cases, I know you don't, I know you may not know what this tumor is, but actually that doesn't matter. I want you to come up with some points. Let's say we're going to operate on this tumor and you want to decide how you're going to go to it. Now you, how you go doesn't matter, but I want you to tell me some features about both this tumor and this patient that would make you pick what do you think the factors might be that allow you to pick an approach or whether you would operate? Somebody from this group here. Sorry. So the anatomy. Okay, so you're talking about, so this gentleman is describing maybe coming endoscopically and what the sphenoid sinus looks like, but how you get to that. Okay, good. So that's one of the things we talked about. This group here. Yeah, what level are you at? Okay, what blood vessels are involved in this tumor? It's a full carotid artery. I don't know how well it projects. What else? Yeah, basal artery. Good. This group here. No. 
very reserved. Okay, the last group. Anything else you would consider? You're going to save your opinions for later. Okay, good. So these are some of the things that we think about uh, when we when we are um, when we are going for a tumor like that, which you've mentioned. So where is it located? The structures around it. Whether it's soft, tough, or okay, I, I think that really matters actually. How tough the tumor is, and I think that makes a big difference when it's wrapped around uh, key blood vessels. Whether you can really get a complete. Uh, removal of the tumor, is it invading into critical structures? And as you said, involving the nerves, blood vessels. I think working as a team is really important. I've got a really good team of ENT surgeons, max max plastic surgeons. It allows me to do, get to places that I wouldn't normally be able to get to, to have repairs uh, with free flaps and things like that that I otherwise would find very difficult. So I think in a lot of medicine and not just in neurosurgery, but whatever field you're gonna go into, I think more and more we're working in a team, and that is very, very important, I think. What's your thought? What are your thoughts, Mike, on how tough the tumor is? Do you think that matters for getting complete resection? Complete resections of skull based tumors. Do you think the consistency of the tumor matters? I think it makes a difference. Yeah, so trying to get a complete resection, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Coming back to the anatomy a little bit, because I just want to talk about another example. Again, it's, uh, it's about giving you a flavor of what, what this is like. And I know it's, so who is in their first and second year? First and second year of medical school. Okay, second year, you've done some better. Who's in second year, raise your hand. Good, okay, who's here in your second year? So this is a, a coronal slice, okay, like this, through the brain. This is the pituitary gland. This is the uh, sphenoid sinus that's been opened. Can I ask what this nerve is and what this nerve is that I'm about to join at the back? Very good, very good, optic nerves. And they're gonna join and form the, yeah. So here's another example uh, of, of being able to use the anatomy in different tumors to decide what you're going to do. Okay, thank you, is that better? Thank you. So these are a few more examples about how picking the right patient and the right approach is critical in skull-based surgery. So just to look at it again, these are the optic nerves, okay? Just out of interest, do you know what blood vessels these are, roughly? The branch of the carotid. Uh, and the anterior cerebral, yeah. This is the anterior cerebral artery, okay. The ACOM, anterior, they join something called the anterior communicator. Uh, and that always sits on the chiasm. So then we have tumors that are lifting the optic nerves, okay. Tumors that are lifting the optic nerves, but actually also going out lateral to it. And tumors that are completely invading into the chiasm. What you tell the patient about what you're going to be able to do before the surgery, what you do in the surgery, and what expectation you would have afterwards, to a large degree, no matter how skilled you are, is dependent on what it is like. As you can imagine, this sort of tumor is much more straightforward to remove completely and safely, and that's the key. Anybody can take something out completely, but the patient has to be well at the end. Then something like this. Equally, how they present would be very different. Just out of interest, who's in the fourth or fifth year? Fourth year, fifth year? Years, good. What will the patient present with? What sort of eye problem? Yeah, very good, very good. Very likely with bitemporal hemianopia. And how we approach whether you would come endoscopic or open or choose to remove some of it and then use radiotherapy 
that's actually less important, but it's an understanding before you start talking to the patient in clinic that you've thought about it clearly in your head. You've gone through this. You then take a very careful history in what, are, what their expectations are, and it's about managing that. The next slide is just to point out that there are lots of levels for understanding these things. And that's the sort of basic level of looking at it. But as you progress more and more in neurosurgery, this is about the arachnoid from a very famous book by a very famous surgeon called Yazigil. Uh, and these are about the arachnoid layers uh, around the optic nerves. So these are the coverings around the, uh, the nerves and the arteries. And actually how the tumors go on to affect these layers and how you can use that operatively to dissect within these layers to completely remove tumors is critical. Uh, but I think at your stage, I wouldn't worry too much about that, but you should have an understanding that, yes, there's a basic level of anatomy, but then there are much more levels above that. Uh, and this is the next step in fully understanding the arachnoid and how different tumors will displace it differently. And that really matters when it comes to operating on these tumors. Just to give you another example about what we think about when we talk about these corridors in, in skull-based surgery, we're now looking at the back of the head, okay? So this is now the back. We're looking, it's again, a coronal slice. We're looking from the back, looking forward. We've removed the brain stem, and we're looking at this big blood vessel that sits in front of the brain stem, which is the? Basal artery is formed by these two vertebrals. Good. And then we're looking at the cranial nerves that come out at the back in the posterior fossa. There's only one cranial nerve that goes up and down. Sorry? Spinal accessory is the only one that goes up and down. If that spinal accessory, what's that going to be? foramen it goes through. Anyway, don't, don't, sorry? Yeah, jugular foramen. And these are the other cranial nerves that go through it. So when you're operating in this area, it is about trying to find the right approach that protects all of these nerves and these blood vessels that you see. And again, I wouldn't get too worried about the different approaches, but these are the lots of different ways uh, that you can get to the posterior fossa or tumors that are involving the posterior fossa. And then you will, be, you will be faced with these sorts of tumors, okay? So this is in a 32-year-old girl. She's a police officer. Uh, and except, except for some mild headaches and some uh, numbness in her face, she didn't have a lot of other symptoms. And obviously, with a very large tumor like this, in a young patient, the best option is to try and remove as much of it as possible safely. Uh, and you have to decide how you're gonna to come to that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too worried at your stage about how you do that, but you have to have an understanding of the anatomy of the posterior fossa. And you have to understand what each of these, what, what each of these different approaches, where it will get you and, and what you can do to remove a tumor like this. So as an example, this is one approach that gets you to the top of the posture fossa, but there are limitations as to how low you can go with some of these approaches. So with this approach, the so-called Kawase, for most people, you're limited to the top of the IAM. I know Ipe likes to go a lot lower than that when he does his Kawase, but for most people, the top of the IAM would be your limit, the, the uh, internal artery meters. Uh, this is a, if you were to go on to do neurosurgery, this is a real workhorse approach you use a lot of, and you can see why it gets you to a lot of the posterior fossa, okay, coming from behind the ear. Uh, and these are, you know, this is another approach when you, if you want to get lower down. Uh, and finally, this is an approach that I quite like, uh, which gets you to the whole, really the whole of the posterior fossa coming right through the petrous bone. You cut the tentorium and you have, a, you have a very nice view. 
uh, and that's what I use for some of these tumors. And you can you can get almost all of it out. I usually I leave a bit of that tumor because it's going into the cavernous sinus, and I think that's just safer. But the point is, it's about understanding the anatomy. It's about understanding what you can do, and what you're going to achieve safely for each of these patients. And as I said at the start, really, really understanding your anatomy is critical. And as Professor Cherian said, you have to do this a lot. And it's not just about doing it, it's about trying to get better each time. And tomorrow we're going to talk a bit about training in this. And we'll talk about that a bit more. But it's about trying to get better each time. And that will make a very big difference for your patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to invite to Professor Ipcherian to show uh, cases of aneurysms live videos. Sanjay was showing the anatomy of uh, the carotids, the ACAs, and the posterior region. So we thought we should uh, show you some surgeries as well. Uh, so we're going to show you two, two cases. We've had quite a lot of aneurysms uh, last week. Very interesting aneurysms, in fact. Pradesh and uh, the other boys were part of, uh, who are part of our team would uh, tell you. I mean, I, can sh I wish I can show you a few, few more aneurysms. But uh, this one is a double aneurysm. One at the IC bifurcation. You saw Sanjeev putting up the IC bifurcation picture covered in arachnoid. Do you remember that picture? The IC bifurcation into AC and MC. So there was this aneurysm at the IC bifurcation. And then there was another aneurysm at the posterior communicating. So we're going to show you how we did it. That's our uh, operating suit. Those are the aneurysms. So that's uh, what is that vessel? What is that? That's the optic nerve, right? And that, what is that vessel? If that's the optic nerve, what is that vessel? Anybody? That's ICA. And you know, you have a very posterior origin of the anterior cerebral artery. It's uh, not usual. And then you have MCA here under my suction. And that is the aneurysm. I generally never put temporary clips. Um, I don't like putting temporary clips. Uh, so that is a, that's the aneurysm. Looks nice and easy. You have to get it into a point where it is nice and easy. You know, it's like uh, getting a girl to say yes for a proposal, you know. You cannot just rush in and say, will you? And, you know, so the whole point of aneurysm surgery or any surgery is getting into the scenario where you can get this rosy, beautiful picture. And it can go wrong. I mean, it can be a disaster. I mean, you must understand these vessels are in millimeter sizes. Your corridors are very small. You got bleeding all the time. You got a bulging brain. Okay. Now you're going into the lateral side of the carotid where you have the PCOM. I have cut a little bit of the 10, just enough. I have uh, taken off the clinoid, I mean, the anterior clinoid lateral bit. I've taken it off so to uncover the PCOM. And then we are putting in another, another clip there. So that's the PCOM being clipped. And that is the origin of the PCOM you should know. If you clip, if you put a clip towards that side, then you will compromise. Yesterday we clipped the PCOM. Yesterday we clipped the very difficult PCOM. This is another one. So this one, 
is rather easy because the PCOM I can see, the anterior corridor I can see, and I'm putting the clip on that. Okay. So again, when you're putting a clip, no hurries. Okay. Very gentle, relaxed. They say uh, perfect is the enemy of good, but uh, no. Okay. Fear is the enemy of perfect. All right. Remember that. So always, always go for perfection. Okay. As much as you can. Okay. Don't fear that perfect is the good of enemy. That is for averages. All right. Perfect. Fear is the good of fear is the enemy of perfect. No fear. All right. Go for it. Go take it. And then put your clip on. That's it. Finished. Okay. That's your double aneurysm done. Huh? Optic, optic nerve, your frontal lobe, that, I mean, uh, your carotid, your partially removed clinoid. There's no need to remove the entire clinoid here. Okay, it's only a partial removal of clinoid. A little bit of tend is cut here. The brain shouldn't know you went in. Okay? When he wakes up, the brain shouldn't know that you went in. That's how you should do your surgery, right? Uh, it's not possible all the time. Okay, sometimes the brain and everybody will know that the whole neighborhood will know that you went in. Okay. And, uh, but sometimes, uh, most of the time, this will be your aim. So that is what we are showing right now. Okay. So, uh, can I go into the, I think the, it's playing a loop. So now he was, uh, again, uh, uh, Sanjeev was showing the posterior side anatomy, right? So he was asking somebody and uh, somebody answered, it's a spinal accessory nerve and all that. So we're going to show you a distal pica aneurysm again. Very recent, maybe in the last week or something. Last week, perhaps. So it's a distal pica aneurysm, okay? That's aneurysm, okay? And so the patient was presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's not a very usual aneurysm. A pica aneurysm is, I mean, itself is very rare. And a distal pica aneurysm is extremely rare. So you can see that we open exactly where the aneurysm is. That's a dural opening. That's a brain step there. The cerebellum is here. The head is upside down. Okay? The head is upside down. And I'm opening the arachnoid there. Over the aneurysm. You have to separate... You have to separate the arachnoid from the aneurysm, and then you, you need to open the arachnoid. So that's the aneurysm there. No, 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 just the midline suboccipital plane. A slightly paramedian, slightly paramedian. So, very simple. So, that's the aneurysm, and that's the cerebellum. And then you can see the pica, distal pica coming in there. So this is what you need to preserve. Okay. Now, one of the things about pica aneurysm is even if you take that artery, it's okay. But you know what happens when you take a pica distally, the proximal pica in posterior circulation, there is a large series of posterior circulation aneurysms. When you take off the distal branch, you can have proximal thrombosis. So if you have a medial, uh, medial medullary branch or lateral medullary branch of pica going off, so what are those nerves? What is th that nerve going up? Sanjeev was showing you. <laughs> That's the brainstem and the spinal cord. Okay. That's the cerebellar medullary cistern. So I am taking off the blood clots of the aneurysm. We don't have any control here. Okay. The pica, to get pica control, as Sanjeev said, we have to go far lateral. But... Um, if this aneurysm, I mean, we have to make sure that the aneurysm doesn't rupture. It's not always in our hands, but we can make sure there are certain principles to make sure the aneurysm doesn't rupture. So you can see that I'm not pulling on anything. I'm using sharp dissection. Whenever there's a clot to be cut or something, I use sharp dissection, a lot of water. Um, I kind of figure out where the rupture point. So there I use complete sharp dissection and slowly uncover the aneurysm to get into the stage where you can say will you. Okay, so that you can put the clip. All right. Putting the clip, 
is the will you stage. Okay, you go down on your knees and you ask. All right. Before that, you need to get into a stage. All right, you need to make sure. So slowly uncovering that aneurysm. That is the neck. That is the distal pica. That is the other pica. Because these two picas are in, uh, they're very close together. This is a place where you can anastomose them together, actually. A pica to pica anastomosis may be done here. Okay. You will learn the principles of anastomosis on hands-on if you, uh, anybody of you is interested. So you have uncovered. You have not uncovered that part. All right. That is being, that is wisdom. All right. Uh, if you try and uncover that part, that this aneurysm may rupture. And since you don't have any control, uh, that is not precisely the position that you want to be in. Okay. So you are uncovering the neck completely. And then you're seeing where the pica is turning. And then I'm showing my boys as to where I'm going to put the clip on. That is, that should be the neck. Okay. And we have to spare the other pica, which is quite big. You can see the distal pica, other side is quite big. You don't want to be compromising it. When you're ready, slow curved clip. Are you going? Slip in gently. Advance, slip in. There is this entire clipping maneuvers. So that's it. All right. So, and you can see all the, the brainstem anatomy, the cranial nerves, huh? the lateral systems. And now you figured that after clipping, you figured that that part of aneurysm is not clipped properly. So you have to put in another clip, exactly same curve. So you put in another clip. Going all across, that's it, finished. Okay. So that's the entire aneurysm clipped. And you can see the rupture point there. The rupture point is there. So we preserved that. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah. you want to continue on? Huh? Okay. Now we have the best session, which is coffee break.
वेबसाइट पे इसको Professor V. Sundar, who is the head of the New Noble Institute of Neurosciences, he was a former professor of neurosurgery, head Institute of Neurology, Madras Medical College, Chennai. He is a senior consultant at Neurosurgery Centre for Advanced Brain and Spine Surgery under the Tamil Nadu government Mandi Super Specialty Hospital. He has completed 30 years in neurosurgery and is presently working in Nobel Institute of Neurosciences. I would like to welcome him to present his speech. Very good morning to everyone. At the outset, I thank the organizers for 
giving me an opportunity uh, to interact with you people young guys the senior consult consultants are sitting in the front i appreciate every one of you especially the junior colleagues who are uh, getting into the medical profession to know what is neurosurgery because i want to remind you then when i was selected for neurosurgery i was i have taken 15 days to decide whether to join or not to join so i was in a government service in a primary health center i was selected uh, my thought process was uh, hindering me whether i can be a good neurosurgeon or not whether i am uh, really worth doing neurosurgery or not that was my decision at the time then my professor the general surgery professor called me then you have to go join the surgery neurosurgery immediately then i joined in 1983 i joined neurosurgery and completed in 88 i have done a 6 5 years uh, the neuros integrated neurosurgery course at the stanley medical college i thank uh, ayub for his uh, wonderful uh, arrangements for not only the conference the best the best neurosurgical center or in the world i can say assure you that this is the center in which you have everything and i am fortunate to be a part of this institution with this few words i am not going to give you a very uh, sophisticated or a high flown uh, subject to you this is a day to day affair what we are going to face every day the neurosurgeons are facing is the neurotrauma uh, which i am going to talk and what is neurosurgery it is a cranial spinal surgery as well as uh some of the brachial plexus or uh, plexus injury and peripheral nerve injuries which may be associated or may not be associated with or uh, with or without polytrauma this is a, this is a scenario because nowadays our uh, uh, high speed vehicles are come and the number of accident i have no I, in my initial period i have seen uh, isolated head injuries but nowadays i we see always a polytrauma associated with neurosurgery which needs a definite uh, consideration i i want to say no head injury is so slight that it should be neglected or so severe that life should be despaired of this is a statement made by hippocrates that holds good even now even now it is holds good a head injury is the third commonest cause for death in most of the uh, countries next only to myocardial infarction and malignant neoplasms and uh, three fourth of the trauma related deaths or head injury is a sole or major contributory factor uh, professor pantand and the now living giant who is in uh, delhi new delhi he are involved in the neurosurgical training as well as neurosurgical care in the uh, indian headquarters that is a uh, a capital of india he used to, used to say persistent search for better methods of treatment has led to variety of management and modalities and master inactive uh, inactive inactivity was the earliest when we were uh, starting our career it was uh, really really the masterly because uh, m- 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 there was not much advances in the associated uh, specialties that uh, especially, especially Uh, especially the anesthesia department anesthesia department other things were not uh, that much uh, uh, better equipped to cater the needs of the patient so the that was the elder years now we have given place aggressive therapeutic measures since the development of not only neurosurgery the allied sub- subjects in the neurosurgery also developed especially Uh, radiological as well as intensive care or better should we treat all patients equally or we have we are our judgment and uh, concentrate effort to those who are uh, likely to recover both physically and mentally this for this we have to have some uh, predicting factors see in our medras medical college we have done a medras medical college medras Uh, score of uh, the outcome medas outcome score that was but that that can predict only up to 85% or 90% perfection beyond that it is impossible but it is in par with any other uh, 
western world they they say they usually they do not trauma immediate threat to life or relief from physical and mental disability these are outcome can be uh, in these ways reduction of dependence either in the institute or in the hospital or at home social integration at work and at leisure that is a, that is our main aim the patient must go back to his original work that is our aim for that we have to have that is a, what is our aim is whatever the complications happening after trauma must be prevented that can be done only with the, when we act very promptly in the golden hour the first hour of the accident is a golden hour of the victim the fate of the victim depends upon on the spot management that is very very important when you don't have a best on the spot management facilities whatever we do is going to be not that much useful and you have to train people what are that what are the first responders to act swiftly and minimize the secondary happenings their primary injury happened to the neuro neural structures cannot be changed whereas the secondary insults can be prevented by the on the spot management that is very very important second thing is also the mode of transportation because most of the conditions uh, the there are polytrauma the patients must be transported accordingly we have to suspect every head injury when the patient is unconscious unless otherwise it is ruled out you, they, you presume that the patient is having a spinal injury and the medical facilities available in the ambulance is also important nowadays in our uh, india we are having one or eight ambulance with a few fairly good trained people are there and they take the patient and take her even sometimes they ventilate the, they they intubate the patient even they have the ventilator support uh, mechanisms are there there is transport ventilators are available but even all these thing we cannot train 100% of the people which is, which is possible in the near future the clinical factors adversely outcome uh, the outcome what are the uh, severity of the, when the primary brain injury is very severe the outcome is not going to be that good and the secondary intracranial complications happening after injury is also important hypoxia hypercarbia anemia hypotension and the age of the patient the extreme ages either the uh, younger age group whether there is a infant age group or the older people the outcome is going to be a matter and the associated other multiple polytraumas factors they are then prolonged pre hospital time when you don't admit the patient or act swiftly at the time of the injury or if you delay in the uh, bringing the patient to the hospital you have to face a problem admission to the inadequate whatever you admit most of the time when the see this is a scenario always in the world when they see the head injury they will afraid of touching the patient that was that was the people especially not the neurosurgeon i am talking the other general surgeons other people they always afraid of head injury that is a fact but you should not do like that whatever the first aid to be given must be given adequately delayed in inter hospital whenever, whenever there is a delay in the Uh, see, uh, appropriate hospital to be my patient must be shifted. If there is a delay, also you have to have. Why I am telling all these things? You people are going to involve in the first uh, first responder because when the patient is coming to the nearby hospital, there may not be neurosurgeons. There may be some uh, whoever is involved in the casualty care, emergency care is going to be there. You must also take uh, some definitive. uh steps for all these thing and when there is a delay in the definitive surgical management that is also a problem when uh, there there is a you see whatever the neurosurgical uh, procedure is to be done it should be done as early as possible that whenever you have a modulation or whenever you have a interference to be done it must be done as early as possible general principle it is a total injury to the patient really matters and not merely the head injury alone surgical shock is extremely rare in acute head injuries it if it presents shows there are say, some serious damage somewhere else you have to consider death in the head injury is due to one one of the two reasons lethal damage with death in few hours that that patients cannot be 
uh, they, they cannot be brought back normal or uh, even their life will be miserable or something subliminal damage plus fatal complications causing death general body this is not the injury to the bony skull that is important but injury to the brain is more important when the skull bone see you have seen this this is a elevated fracture you see the, there is a bone is exposed and uh, you see this is a extensive injury see the almost uh, see i can show you the see, this, this is the dura you can see the dura you see this is this is a very extensive elevated fracture of the occipital region this is because of an assault and uh, see the, the there is also a one more <laughs> see see there is a fracture here also see this is a linear fracture this is also the, the same patient with the uh, vertex region there is a linear fracture the, this is not a, this, this, it looks uh, when you see the patient it may look like or but the, this patient can be treated accordingly see the uh, whenever there is a uh, injury to the head injury you have to you have to rule out uh, cervical spine injury first you have to if possible you see this this, this particular patient you see there is a uh, there is a subluxed patient see? this patient a 68 year old man uh, admitted with a occipital injury they have sutured the injury and then the patient but the patient was quadriplegic and uh, there is a, this, uh, a subluxation of this see this is ct scan of the sir there is a same patient ct cervical scan you see see the in uh, the displacement of the thing okay this is the thing this is a uh, ct scan of the same patient so that that is a uh, important whenever there is a uh, weakness of uh, all four limbs you have to think of uh, cervical spine if the patient does not recover fully to previous conscious level within a reasonable time after a seizure or intravenous sedation something seriously wrong you have to investigate the patient lack of improvement over a period of time after head injury is equal to deterioration and it causes uh, it, uh, the cause must be investigated see this is a small uh, depressed fracture see see the uh, fracture see this patient is having a depressed fracture here and it is elevated this is, this is a child of four years old sustained injury uh, accidental fall she had a depressed fracture this depressed fracture is elevated you see the, the same patient the depressed fracture ct scan before elevation after elevation you see the after there is a see this is a airlock after removal this is a thing after elevation of the thing you see the patient is also having a, a fracture there is a multiple fracture of the patient here it is a parietal bone here it is a frontal bone head injuries can be divided into three categories based on the state of consciousness never unconscious to be watched so some patients may may not may have a loss of consciousness or maybe even the loss of consciousness may be a transient Uh, with a lucid interval that is very very important what is lucid interval means the patient may be the initial unconsciousness for few minutes recover and then if the patient is going for once again a deterioration in the level of consciousness that is called lucid interval if it presents you need not hesitate that patient have a high chance of uh, the urgent surgical maneuver to be done because most of the time extra dural hematoma because previously when we were, we were student we were taught that when there is a lucid interval you have to do uh, whatever the thing you have, we we do exploratory burhole at the time uh, there was a six uh, point six places we put burhole and i we have in my my career when i started in 1984 i still remember one fellow admitted with a train traffic accident fairly a good uh, gastro trauma skill before uh, so admission he was uh, unconscious then recovered then uh, one of my pg who roommate was a general surgeon on duty he called me he was recovered to a level now he is deteriorating please come and see we put a burhole exploratory burhole unfortunately the burhole was put in the, uh, the standard position and there was nothing was there my chief, i called my chief there is nothing i am not able to see he asked me to put a para central 
that is para sagittal bar hole then we put there was a inter hemispheric uh, huge uh, adh that patient operated uh, and uh, craniotomy then evacuation done and the patient recovered well that that, that was that was the, my, during our early period that is i am talking about 1984 now the scenario is entirely changed immediate management always uh, whenever there is a injury always keep the airway first uh, clear all the time exclude major bleed in this from the scalp uh, other places the visceral injuries to be and long bone injuries also to be taken care of exclude cervical spine injury always when in doubt you presume that then there is a doubt about uh, the cervical spine injury always put a cervical collar and uh, mobilization must be done accordingly informed anesthetist also whenever because the anesthetist is also to be informed this patient we suspect uh, we may the patient may have a cervical spine because the intubation manipulation they will take care of uh, precautions the then always a routine things like uh, intravenous fluid and avoid dextrose always the dextrose should be avoided and pass rails tube and empty the stomach because if you don't empty the stomach the patient may go for vomiting the vomitus even smallest amount of vomitus may choke the patient and will go for further complications pass the foley catheter blood grouping and typing to be done because the patient may need any time we may taken up for surgery when whenever necessary never sedate patient till you do a ct scan brain see if you have a facility to do a ct scan then you can sedate otherwise because you cannot predict what is whether the patient is going for unconscious nor or he is in sedation so that's why you avoid indication of prophylactic antibiotics whenever there is a scalp injury when there is a road traffic accident because always it is uh the injury is contaminated so we must always put prophylactic and well potential chest infection is also because you know, whatever the thing is, there must be some aspiration always take place in the initial stages when the patient is unconscious even small amount of vomitus may get aspirated and they may have, have a problem in the chest impending surgeries when we plan for surgery you have to put a indication of prophylactic anti convulsants whenever there is a the patient is having history of seizure then when post traumatic seizure when the patient may had a, a seizure after injury you have to have anti convulsant all the depressed fractures you have to put uh, whenever there is extra dural subdural subarachnoid and intra subdural hemorrhages you have to plan for the thing avoid furosemide and uh, manitol uh, unless otherwise indicated neurological assessment the neurological assessment must be done Uh, as uh, quickly they it should not take more time and uh, the especially the differential diagnosis of unilateral fixed pupillary dilatation or transitorial herniation may be due to be extradural subdural or uh, ich or edema these are this can cause or even the contusions can cause then there is a orbital injury and optic nerve injuries can produce unilateral uh, pupillary dilatation and a fracture superior orbital fissures these are these the patient should be investigated thoroughly and to be treated accordingly at the earliest to have a better vision uh, and the sometimes when there is extra dural and all it's a life saving surgery see a consciousness always uh, uh, assessed by glasgow coma scale so there are, there are uh, three things eye opening verbal response and the best motor response these are all the thing we always uh, do it and we do it periodically but it's easy to do it bedside any number of time you can uh, do it there may be some amount of observer uh, differences may be there uh, but uh, by and large most of the time we may have a glasgow coma scale is the only thing you can do assess the patient with the easy easy way anybody can do it even the beginner can do it soft nurses can do it and uh, if they assess there is a deterioration in the level of consciousness in glasgow coma scale 15 bar 15 is the fully conscious patient and 3 bar 15 is the lowest thing and any patient below glasgow coma scale scale age 8 bar 15 should be always intubated uh, you see the uh, ct scan brain indications when you what are the conditions in will the immediate ct scan i am talking about immediate ct scan nowadays Uh, the patient most of the time we always receive the patient with the ct scan but 
whenever the patient is not having ct scan these are all the condition when the glasgow stoma scale is for 14 or less children of the age of 6 years are younger elderly persons above 60 years now the 60 years is not a great term Uh, age because the uh, longevity of life is now throughout the world is increased especially in, in india when i born it was only 35 to 40 years now it is 67 and uh, nowadays in uh, even the 67 65 people they never call them as old they call it the young people that was the latest thing and uh, focal neurological deficit is always whenever there is a focal neuro neurological deficit in the form of hemiplegia or hemiparesis or bonoparesis you have to do a ct scan pupillary asymmetry is a indication whenever there is a cs of leak either a cs of rhinorrhea or otorrhea you have to do suspected additional pathology whenever we suspect something more we have to do a thing and all gun, gunshot injuries and penetrating injuries always uh, do a ct scan conscious level cannot be assessed due to other causes so many times we 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 we, all, we we cannot assess because the patient may be patient may be having some always see the patient and not scan in so many occasions we we never see the patient we see the scans when there is no correlation between the ct scan and the clinical condition kindly repeat or repeat the examination after some time ct scan see this is a ct scan of the patient Uh, it is not very clear. Uh, the, the, see, you can see some of the see subarachnoid. See, see, these are all the subarachnoid. The same patient. Uh, see, this, this patient is having a uh, SAH and interhemispheric blood also there. there are, this is a CT scan of the patient. And the same patient we need to uh, take MRI. You see, the why the MRI was taken was the patient's uh, condition was not uh, related. To, see, see, that's why we. You see, there is a hemorrhagic contusion. Is there? See, this is a hemorrhagic contusion which is visualized in the MRI. Uh, CT scan is no role in acute DD. MRI, MRI is not a big, uh, major role except in delayed complication. This is the same patient. See, this is you see the MRI of the patient. The CT scan almost showed only a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and there is say, there are some delayed responses to this thing. This is the same patient with the MRI. admission to the hospital when you admit the patient age all the patients below the age of 12 years and above the age of 60 now it may be a 70 years alcohol whenever the patient is in the alcohol effect or drug drug effect he should be admitted all patients with the altered vital signs especially pulse bp respiration there is a, see when there is a bradycardia or a tachycardia tachycardia may be there may because of shock uh hypovolemic shock may be neurological status all patients with concussion impaired consciousness confusion or altered sensory impairment should be admitted when there is, whenever there is a systemic injury fracture skull all fractures to be admitted and especially vault and the base of the skull ent bleeding cs of leak either in the nose or from the ears you have to uh, social indication sometimes we may also and there are medical legal reasons when i see the, that is a proper admission into the normal ward here the patient may need uh, intensive care uh, management whenever the patient is uh, gcs is below 8 he, he must be admitted in the intensive care very young children very old person and a head injury with spinal injuries patients with the potential neurological deterioration and uh, severe edema and contusion of the uh, in ct scan brain cs of rhinorrhea and otorrhea nemocephalus uh, extradural subdural intracerebral hemorrhages frequent sedation after injury to be given when you that patient when the patient is restless we may repeat the uh, sedation so these patient must be admitted in the uh, icu gunshot injuries penetrating injuries multiple trauma the very polytrauma is uh, now Uh, always uh, because the long bone injuries uh, visceral injuries chest injuries facio maxillary injuries these are all the thing especially the facio maxillary injury when there is a mandible fracture and uh, sometimes it may be troublesome the patient may not open the mouth or close the mouth uh, there may be every possibility of aspiration these patient must be admitted in this thing 
pulmonary pulmonary cardiac and hepatic complication renal dysfunctions are the associated with because the patient may be elderly patient may have all these uh, comorbid conditions these patients may be admitted in the icu if there any other uh, medical complication okay is just finishing cs of rhinorrhea the patients are best guide to indicate the position of cs of knee and uh, if not forward bending or uh, jugular compression will provoke the cs of knee and uh, more than when the cs of knee is more than uh, 30% of sugar is seen then you have to suspect that uh, there is cs of knee the nasal discharge sometimes may may some of the watery discharge of the nasal other than cs of rhinorrhea uh, due to rhinitis may have been there and the target test when we put a, a kerchief and a, collect the thing there will be a target sign will be there may risk of meningitis whenever there is a csf you always have a, a post traumatic csf leak you have a feature of meningitis brain abscess hydrocephalus seizures and the behavioral disorder these are all complications of meningitis post traumatic headache headache after head injury can be due to very minor cause or can be due to potentially fatal complication it needs immediate complete investigation and the advice of the specialist post traumatic seizures seizures after head injury can be due to very mild problem or potentially is lethal complications also it also needs uh, immediate and complete investigations and advice of specialist prevention why i am coming to the this is almost i am nearing my end of my topic prevention is always better than cure what prevent two aspect in the prevention one is the prevention of accident itself second the prevention of the secondary complications what is happening after injury to be taken care so i request all our junior colleagues we always insist please insist all driving two wheelers to wear crash helmet we are seat belt while traveling in the car don't use mobile phone while driving or walking in the road don't drink alcohol and drive and uh, follow the road, road safety rules uh, strictly avoid uh, football travel or train uh, uh, football travel educate all the road users first responder on the spot management including first aid procedures do's and don'ts and spinal injuries spinal injuries uh, you know uh, there is uh, whenever there is a spinal injury always there are three the cervical thoracic lumbar sacral these are the thing and uh, if it is a cervical region always uh, quadriplegia uh, dorsal region paraplegia and uh, lower down you have always a uh, chronic pain related diseases spinal injury is generally caused uh, as a lesion high in the cervical spine irreversible and fatal sometimes damages of the spinal cord further uh, down to the level of the upper th thoracic is always quadriplegia lower uh, dorsal is always paraplegia lower down you will have a backache localization of spinal injuries depends upon the when there is a quadriplegia you would put it in a cervical and you can have some uh, clinical assessment which can be done history of trauma generally the slow pulse unilateral posture un unnatural posture you may have pale cold uh, clammy skin tingling and unusual absent feeling in the limbs absence of pain in the limbs inability to move the arms or legs venile erection on the onset of spot these are all the features of the thing care you must take care of abc along with the thing spinal thing and uh, you have the, the in our area it is 108 uh, you see here you can call for an ambulance extreme care in the initial examination unable to control airway carefully remove the helmet helmet removal also is very important uh, cervical collar treat the shock treat any other injuries may maintain body heat always if movement required log roll and use the assistance for that thing always maintain like a head headline with the shoulders of the spine spinal shock the spinal shock is always the, the patient may not have a um, see pulse rate will not go up in spinal shock so whenever there is a bradycardia associated with a, uh, hypotension you have to think of a spinal shock thank you very much for your uh, kind attention and thank you thank you
we have our next speaker dr hira buran he is a medical graduate from pakistan and the present president of azam mrs society and also the prime organizer of this conference she will be speaking on shiatic shift edema assalamu alaikum okay thank you thank you raj um so um okay so uh thank you dr sundar for highlighting the trauma and the importance of neuro trauma uh my talk is similar but the only difference is that we are discussing the pathophysiology of neuro trauma that is um for medical students most of us uh, we are all medical students here so we have gone through the uh physiology of edema the pathophysiology of edema we know that there are two types of uh, edema uh, vasogenic and cytotoxic but what exactly causes trauma is a csf shift edema which i'll be describing in the next few slides first let's see how uh, big is this problem as professor sundar has already highlighted these are the countries uh, the one in uh, darker blue they contribute the most to neuro trauma in the world so there has to be something which needs to be dealt with in uh, with great care so what exactly is csf shift edema it's a new word for all of us um we hypothesize that the brain or the cranium is a rigid box what happens in trauma is we all know that subarachnoid hemorrhage is the uh, accumulation of blood in the cisterns which are the subarachnoid spaces in simpler language for medical students so these subarachnoid spaces when there is hemorrhage it occupies the space and this causes the movement of csf csf is flowing mostly in the subarachnoid spaces we all know that the csf shifts from the ventricle we all know the whole cycle right but csf is mostly accumulated in the subarachnoid system during trauma when the subarachnoid vessels hemorrhage the blood from the subarachnoid vessels in passes into the cisterns this causes the flow of the fluid as you can see here from the cisterns into the blood what causes what facilitates this flow is the virtual robin spaces these are the paravascular spaces which we which allow for the selective movement of fluid from the cisterns into the brain parenchyma are you all with me okay what we do in uh, trauma surgery for surgery we need once we understand what is the basic pathology behind we can reverse this shift by causing a a small letting out procedure from the cisterns once you let out the accumulated fluid you see what happens back the blood goes back into its normal physiological state that is the hypothesis of csf shift and its reversal which is known as cystinostomy so this is a uh, a diagram which shows that uh, here you can see here the artery enters into the brain parenchyma this is the site of exchange of fluid once trauma occurs this causes the leakage of fluid not blood mind that not blood but only fluid from the capillaries into the brain parenchyma through the virtue of its spaces which allow for selective movement of fluid from the capillaries into the brain parenchyma so this um, i really do not want to go much into the um, text i want you to know the concept more so for this if you understand this better this is a subarachnoid space okay we have the subarachnoid vessels passing through this space one of the branches goes into the brain parenchyma this whole part is the brain parenchyma in trauma this vessel disrupts what happens is that this vasculature allows leakage of blood into the arachnoid space now this causes this causes a lot of pressure built up inside the cisterns this pressure allows the movement of the fluid in order to reduce that pressure fluid has to get out it cannot be compressed right so this has to get out and how this gets out is through the 
presence of these virtual organ spaces, they, they are already lining, but during trauma, they are expressed more. So these aquaporin channels allow for the fluid to pass from the subarachnoid cistern through the virtual organ spaces via the aquaporin channels into the brain parenchyma. And the overall picture which you see in a traumatic brain is edema, edematous aggressive brain. So for clarity, let me repeat, this is not blood which is going into the brain. It is the CSF from the subarachnoid spaces which is entering the brain spaces. Now, in order to research this and to uh, have more evidences, we had an experiment done in Calgary. In this experiment, they used mice brains as uh, models. What they did was is to uh, mimic the scenario of traumatic brain injury and by putting uh, heavy weight models in this uh, mice brain, what happened after they put uh, uh, weight on the brain, this similar picture appeared. And then they saw through MRI imaging, here, this is a normal MRI before trauma. Here you don't see much accumulation of fluid here in, in, uh, and the intensities are also very low. But what happened after TBI, after trauma, is that all the brain, you can see a lot of fluid accumulation. And the intensity of the MRI scans was high. Another, another uh, pathology, pathophysiological finding, you can see clearly here that there's very little blood accumulation. However, over here, if you see, there's a lot of fluid which is causing increased interneuronal spacing. So that is the concept of cerebral edema due to CSF shift. So this study very well concludes that um, this um, CSF shift is the cause which is causing the picture of uh, traumatic brain injury when we see once we open the cranium and we see that the brain is bulging out. That is all because of that. So one uh, method to decrease it is to do cystinostomy. Now for people, uh, there's a difference, uh, ventricular drain and cisternal drain. This is a bit uh, uh, above topic, but we have to highlight the fact here that the ventricles do not, con we have 120 ml of CSF circulating in the brain, which is causing cooling and cleaning. This will be described by Professor Cherian in his next talk. But the ventricles do not contain as much CSF as the cisterns do. So even if you put a drain inside the ventricle, it will not cause that tremendous change in the uh, pressures and a release of the uh, edema as compared to a drainage. as compared to a drainage done through the cisternal opening. So another experiment in which they studied, typically this fact was, they injected photon tracers, one in the ventricular system and one into the cisternal system. What happened in the ventricular infusion was that there was no edema seen, as you can see. On the other hand, in the, in the cisternal injection, there was massive illumination, as you can see from both the images. So there is, a strong evidence which says that uh, that brain parenchyma is in direct communication with the cisterns rather than the ventricles. So it is very much legit to open the cisterns rather than the ventricles to let down the CSF pressures. It's the same thing. This is the this is usually one of parts of our first year uh, physiology lectures in which we always study the monroe kelly doctrine. This is uh, almost all of you should know this, that increasing the volume after some time exponentially increases the pressures. So in what EVD does is to increase the compliance. That is, it gives us more space. But what a cisternal drain will do is to relieve the pressure. That is what we want in a traumatic brain, right? So cystinostomy, now, it's, now it will make much more sense, is that we let out the CSF from the cisterns and uh, this will reverse that edema which happened during trauma after the movement of CSF from the virtual organ spaces into the parenchyma. So this on one side, this is what we, this is what we do in uh, cystinostomy. We are letting out CSF from the cistern 
relieving the pressure of the brain downwards on the other hand decompression causes the decompression involves the removal of a cranial the brain flap a bone flap but what happens here as you can see is the brain oozes out and during this oozing what is the tre uh, tremendous damage is to the axonal pathways the cortical pathways are damaged we have a lot of extensive axonal injury which leads to a vegetative state even after the patient is operated so relieving intracranial pressure in decompression is not the only goal we have to prevent further damage which is caused by this um, axonal damage so um i would like to take some time to um, highlight the outcomes which we have uh, till now in this uh, center at the at professor cherian center initially during the transition phase uh, this was the these were the statistics um and you can clearly see a decrease in the number of uh, icu days mortality decreased from 34% to 15% and uh, uh, this was the stage when we were transformed trans uh, it was a it was a transitional phase now cystinostomy is performed extensively for trauma in the center we include all patients who need to be included for this except for ischemia why because ischemia there's no point to do this ischemia there already damage has happened so this will not help much we don't include patients above uh, 70 these are all the exclusion criteria you can read about that Yeah. Preoperative GCS is important, and pupillary dilatation is important factor in determining when to intervene. Um, we can see that uh, preoperatively, most of the patients had obliterated cisterns. This is an indication. But what before that? Even before that, what we see in the scans is this this part. between the pons and the vitreous bone this is the ct angle cerebellar pontine angle what happens in a traumatic vein it, it it herniates it herniates down the tent so what happens when you see this widening as you can see here as you can see here this ct angle it widens so it's a clear indication that you need to intervene surgically this we did the study in this uh, center and we found a very important association between uh, cp angle widening clinically normally does not produce much uh, symptoms uh, other than ipsilateral uh, pupillary dilation uh, otherwise if you see the scan uh, if you see a scan in which there is evident cp angle widening you need to intervene before complete herniation occurs and it involves posterior structures like the parahippocampal guard in all the cases uh, who underwent cystinostomy there was uh, opening of the supracellular cisterns that is the most concentrated area for csf so they opened pressures were decreased and on the fifth day before removal it decreased down to 7 cm of water mortality decreased significantly except in those patients in which the preoperative gcs was really less at a follow up of 2 months uh, the patients uh, the mortality was only one in patients with above uh, 8 gcs and uh, in patients who were already uh, in a deteriorated stage before surgery 10 of them had uh, died rest we had very good results as you can see from this data i'll just go through these cases very quickly uh, these are the post operative scans um, of a patient with uh, he presented with brain swelling you can see clearly uh that there is a uh, obliteration of cisterns after undergoing cystinostomy these are the post operative scans this patient uh, had a gcs of 15 by 15 after a week another case He presented with a gcs of 6 this is his uh, pre operative scan with a left pupillary dilatation and uh, fixed pupils non reactive underwent cystinostomy post operatively he had a gcs of 15 and he is talking this is the patient now he is doing really, really well another case this lady presented with bilateral fixed pupil gcs of 4 underwent cystinostomy after evacuation of an sdh and post operatively her scans and this is her status 
So uh, to conclude, cystinostomy is a combination of you need a microscope to operate on this, of course. So it's a it's a it's an incorporation of microsurgical technique to open the cisterns, let out the CSF from the cisterns in a moderate to severe head injury. Our goal is to prevent the progression to cytotoxic brain injury so that the patients are not in a vegetative state as in an appropriate setup, this should be an ideal surgical procedure to be performed, needs adequate training, of course. ICU and surgery care are a complementary, uh, they need to go hand in hand to provide the best outcome in neurotrauma. We do require a multi-center trial, which is now underway. And cystinostomy is now being discussed. It's being talked about in journals, in various publications, in conferences, and it's a hot topic now in neurotrauma care. So we need to have both ends meet and discuss about cystinostomy. One important progression is that we have been enrolled in this. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, trials being done in neurotrauma. More than 300 centers are participating worldwide. And uh, these are the principal investigators from the Cambridge group. Professor Cherin is one of the honorary advisory panels. We have Professor Kato, who is the president of ACNS. She'll be here with us tomorrow. Um, and this, uh, you can see that they have identified cystinostomy as one of the options for traumatic brain injury, surgical options. So that is it from my side. Thanks. I would like to invite, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you talk about hydrocephalus, that is the ventricular system which you are talking about. Yes, yes. In cystinostomy, we are concerned with the communication between the cisterns and the parenchyma. We are not including the ventricular system. So what happens is in cystinostomy, when we are letting out the CSF, we are decreasing the pressures. And when that pressure decreases, then the CSF is let out and then the brain edema decreases. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so it will, it will. Yes, yes, please. We have the founder of Cystinostomy with us.
One side is enough. You know, the cisternal compartment is connected. So uh, one side of cisternostomy would be enough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because we don't have a pre op ICP, we don't, as a policy, we don't put in a pre op ICP. So we really cannot tell you how much the ICP goes down. But then, if you see, if the systems are obliterated, there is a paper, there's a beautiful paper in the Lancet which says that if the systems are obliterated, the ICP is always more than 25. Okay, so this is a radiological way of figuring out that if the systems are obliterated, the ICP is always more than 25. And most of the, if most of the time, it's over 40. So if the systems are obliterated and there are many phases of it. Now, if you, if you try and open the cisterns, except when there is ischemia, you can see this dramatic reduction in. Yeah, what we do is we put in a, yeah, we put in a, we, we always put in a, a feeding tube number eight into the prepondine system. And then that remains for five days. Unless the boys have changed the number of days, five days. No, we don't put in anything into the brain parenchyma. Uh, but then, you know, we are thinking of designing a study. We have intraoperative MR right now. So we are thinking of, and we have MR elasto also. One of the things that you see really, you know, which is really uh, very, very profound that you see is, you see the feeling of the brain. The brain is so tense before surgery. And once the cisterns are opened and washed out, the brain is really lax. So we thought we could document it with MR elasto. And that's what we are looking at right now. You know, skull base for aneurysm is very boring, you know. You guys are going to sit and sleep because it'll be interesting to the first row of people. I showed you some aneurysms. I saw sagging faces and WhatsApp messages going all over the place. So instead of uh, doing skull base for aneurysms, I'm going to tell you about our journey on uh, cystinostomy, on cooling and cleaning, and uh, generally how we are at where we are. Okay. So back in 2006, I, it's almost uh, 12 years when we finished neurosurgery from Velour. As usual, uh, like all the other consultants, like what Viknesh is right now, okay, freshly passed out neurosurgery consultant. You have your head in the clouds, huh? you're a neurosurgeon, you're young, okay, you, you feel that like the whole world uh, is within your grasp. And the only thing you want to do is uh, skull base and vascular, because these are the most difficult and the most prestigious. I wouldn't agree to that right now. Everything is prestigious, uh, okay? So, but at that point of time, the most prestigious thing for, for the guys my age and my qualification was skull base and vascular. So we went to, I went to Japan with Professor Kato and Professor Sano, and then I, I did my fellowship. And then I was all like uh, Sudagar. So I wanted to do it early, and so I, I did it, and then I came back. The only thing I wanted to do was aneurysms, okay? 
nothing else. Just aneurysms. If there's any skull base, skull base is something that which I hardly understood at that time. I mean, can we put off that fan or is it a problem? People feeling hot or warm? Right. So at that time, I didn't really understand the skull base. I mean, as I would understand it now, I thought uh, meningioma removal was skull based. I mean, which 90% of the guys still think it is. It's not skull based. So, um, what I did was I had a junior consultant who was not trained in micro, I mean, micro surgical uh, technique. So, he used to scrub with me all the, all the time. So you, we did not have smartphones which could send you images or you could not do video calls and all that. We had a phone which could send one message, you know, it was the alpha, maybe the alpha numerical cell phones, the, the beginning granddaddies of cell phones. I don't know, you boys have seen it or not, or you girls and boys have seen it or not. So I got a message uh, and then I'd say that you, we had an aneurysm and a trauma and uh, so, obviously, trauma, who wants to do trauma? I mean, we've uh, spent our entire childhood and uh, residency doing trauma. So, I mean, residents do trauma. We're not doing trauma. We are, I'm a consultant. So, I said, okay, get the aneurysm ready. Send me the angiogram. Give me the, send me the angiogram with the ambulance driver. That was the only way. So, the ambulance driver brought the angiogram and I looked at it, it's an A com aneurysm. Okay, rather big, well defined neck, everything good, beautiful A com, a sexy little aneurysm sitting there. So I said, okay, I'm coming, prepare the patient. And uh, one hour later, I go to this, I go to the theater and I find a large flap. Usually that was the norm, you know, when uh, aneurysms, unlike in the West or in Japan, we always have ruptured aneurysms which are bad grades so you cannot go ahead with a small craniotomy and very clean to clean uh, picture to start with it's always a mess to start with okay so we need a large craniotomy and there was a large craniotomy and this patient had a lot of subarachnoid blood so i started i went into the interoptic optic carotid system and opened out everything cleaned out a lot of blood everything did everything I started looking for the aneurysm and uh, went on and on and on and on. I figured out the A1, figured out where the ICA is, figured out uh, where the PCOM is, no aneurysm. Okay. And you know, it was 10, 11 years back. So I was not, uh, even now I'm not so experienced, but then at that time, definitely not so. I got a bit nervous and I told this guy, hey boss, we don't have an aneurysm. I can't see an aneurysm. It looks like I had to close without flipping the aneurysm. So this guy is a very stoic. I mean, he speaks very little. So he's like Pramod, okay, one of my consultants out. He doesn't speak too much, you know. He just said it's not the aneurysm, it's the trauma. So, I mean, I told him something in Malayalam, which I cannot translate right now. So I told him something and then I, I, was, uh, I was mad. I had asked him to put the aneurysm first. And here I was sitting on a trauma and operating all the, I mean, opening all the cisterns and washing out and looking for an aneurysm. So, I mean, if I had a gun, I would have shot him. So I, I mean, I told him, see, listen, boss, you should have at least told me that, uh, you know, this is not aneurysm. He said, you didn't ask me. Then I said, okay, but I told you to post the aneurysm first. He said, the trauma dilated the people. And that's why I took it up. He was correct in every way. There was nothing I could find fault with him. I didn't ask him. I made an assumption that it is an aneurysm. And I went in and I started operating. So it was completely, I mean, I was completely at the wrong end. But then... When I saw that, I saw the scan and I saw it was a pretty severe head injury. And after, I mean, it was really bulging. When we opened the dura, it was really bulging. 
and I opened the cisterns and I treated it just like an aneurysm. I didn't treat it like a trauma. I treated the, the head injury just like an aneurysm. Okay? And the brain responded just like an aneurysm. That was very strange. So still, I didn't have the guts to put the bone flap back and treat it like an aneurysm after knowing that it's an aneurysm. You know, sometimes knowledge is bad. Okay? Because our preconceptions, whatever we know, you know, leads us in the wrong places. So I didn't put the bone flap back. I said, watch this guy. And I went out. And I had to come again in the night and uh, clip the aneurysm, which reason, I mean, which went off very well, actually. So next day on rounds, this guy was struggling around to be extubated. And uh, we didn't have the mind because in Velour, we have seen people in the place where I train, I've seen people like that head injury getting extubated, never getting extubated. You know, they will be put on a, a tracheostomy tube and then they will be left out. So this guy who had a massive subdural, the subdural was drained and the cisterns were open. This guy was struggling to be extubated. So two days later, we very, very, you know, we, we didn't have our mind. To, we didn't have, uh, we were not willing to, but then we extubated him and he did very well. So, I mean, this got me thinking. I thought, okay, let's see. If I can open all the cisterns in uh, trauma, this would be excellent training for me because aneurysms come maybe once in two days or three days in a government hospital. But then traumas are like four or five every day. So, let me start opening the cisterns here. And then see how it is. And that is how we started. That is how we started in 2006. But then I remember presenting my first paper in Adam Brooks, Oxford's enemy in Cambridge. It was 2007. I remember the, the English, they're also very stoic. You know, they, they don't say anything. And at the end of it, I had one of our family friends, Charles Malcolm Brown, who's, uh, who's a history professor, by the way, who was sitting to listen to my presentation along with Richard Lang's unit. And uh, Professor Hutchison was there, there. He didn't say anything. He just made a wry smile. And then the rest of the... Lang said, it's interesting. So I was very happy. I went to Charles' home and we were sitting for dinner and said, I told the Charles, this guy said, it's interesting. So Charles said in English, English, I, interesting means nonsense. So I, I understood what he meant by interesting. So uh, then that's how we started. Okay. But now things are a bit more different. In 2012, we were, uh, we had a chapter in the World Federation of Neurosurgery textbook. And then when Schumacher had an injury, so the Emmanuel Gay, the treating neurosurgeon, had sent the scans over to us because one of our fellows was there and he told us this guy does some miraculous cure. But then Schumacher already had a hemicranectomy on one side and a frontal lobectomy on the other. So as much as I would have liked to go and see the man and uh, say that there's nothing to be done, I said, no, there's nothing to be done because already two surgeries have been done. So then Schumacher was sent to Lausanne and the chief at Lausanne happened to be somebody who, who was a former chief, former professor in Velo. He came down to Nepal. He saw how it was done. Then he went back and started it in Europe. And, and then Wang's friend Goi started it in China. And then things started spreading. From 2012 till now, it's been a steady growth. We've had our share of criticisms. We had our share of people saying it won't work. We had our share of everything. But then now in the genome study, as Hira has shown, it's been put as an option. If you're up to do it, go ahead and do it. So that's where we are at right now. But that's just a synostomy. You know, when we started the surgery, we didn't know how it was working or why it was working. We didn't know. Then I started thinking, why should it work? I started thinking about Monroe Kelly doctrine and I figured that the Monroe Kelly doctrine was completely wrong. It was made 100 years back. And anything made 100 years back 
is evolving. I wouldn't say it is wrong. Today, surgery is probably the way to treat brain tumors. 100 years from now, maybe genetic, maybe slicing is the way to treat tumors. And then we cannot laugh at people who were, who did surgery. I mean, you know, Jacob Chandi had a mortality of 100%. In Valor, when he started the department, they say every single patient who used to go to the theater used to come back dead. I cannot laugh at him because if he didn't start, I wouldn't be doing neurosurgery. I mean, somebody said Lawton surgeries are so much more elegant than Spetzler surgery. Obviously, it is because Spetzler started and Lawton was a student. I expect my uh, residents or my student surgeries to be much more elegant than mine. That is progress. That is how things go. So, but 100 years old principles, they are evolving. I wouldn't say they are wrong. We evolved. And what was Mandrokili doctrine 100 years back doesn't hold true anymore because we know a lot of things more now. So let us look at what we know. Now you all know that what is the organ having the maximum blood supply? If you're thinking something else, naughty it's not. What is the, what is the organ that has got the maximum blood supply? What is the organ with the maximum metabolism? Huh? In this time? Maybe for you. <laughs> you look like it. <laughs> all right. No, they're not in this time. No, with all the mesenteries and all that, no. I mean, as much as biryanis you eat, no. It's not. The adrenals, they say, but uh, the adrenals is a tiny wee little thing. Okay? But look at the brain. It consumes one-fifth of the blood supply. Such a small thing consumes one-fifth of the blood supply. Okay? Can you imagine how much heat it produces? How much metabolites it produces? Have you ever wondered why cannot we work 24 hours? Why do we have to sleep? Why do we need to sleep? What happens during sleep? So these are all the questions which I started asking myself. So, first thing first, the theory that the CSF is kept as a suspension for brain. You think it's right? It's right. For sure, it's right. Now, imagine if I told you the brain is water-cooled system. Brain is a water-cooled system. And along with the vessels, the CSF also went in. How does it go in? Da Vinci screw. You know Da Vinci screw? If you keep a vessel or something which is pulsating and you keep a tube around it, watertight tube, the pulsations will carry the, the CSF around it upwards. You understand what I'm meaning? The Da Vinci screw principle. The pulsations will carry the CSF up. And that is how the CSF reaches to every part of the brain. That is the first thing I realized. And that is what happens in old age. When the pulsations are not there, people develop problems. The cooling part of the brain is not working. Okay? Now, next thing. How does the CSF cool? How is the CSF itself, how is the supracellar system cooling? Have you ever thought about it? Now, what are the sinuses? What do the sinuses do? You have maxillary sinus, you have ethmoid sinus, you have sphenoid sinuses. They're all lined with wet mucosa. And when you are breathing, when you breathe, what happens? Bernoulli's principle, low pressure in each of these sinuses. And what happens to them? 
the water in them evaporates and so what if they, they evaporate what happens the latent heat of evaporation is lost in these sinuses and these sinuses are 2.5 degrees cooler there are thermometry studies to indicate that the sinuses are 2. Point, this part brain this part of the face is 2.5 degrees cooler than the rest of the face and how is it important with the csm how is it important with the csm the largest collection of csf sits right in the middle of the sinuses the largest collection of csf the supracellular cistern is sitting right in the middle of the sinuses isn't it interesting it's a beautiful design you have supracellular cistern you have all the vessels you have spaces around these vessels these vessels are pulsating this supracellular cistern is cooled and these csf the cooled csf is sent into the wurzelrobin spaces by these pulses to all parts of the brain and you know when that when that happens they are controlled by acuporin four channels you know when that happens sleep when you sleep the acuporin channels open up and that is why you have to sleep if you cannot sleep what do you do you do last glitch effort by your brain to cool it a last glitch effort may not be successful three four times and then all right so this is how this, we, this is what we proposed that the csf is cooling the brain and now when i talked about this in a conference in india there was a there was a scientist who was very in, interested she was uh, working with the art of living ashram she is the director of the research group of art of living so they said we do something called uh, what kriya sudarshan kriya basically what they do is they keep on doing it i I've, i've seen uh, i mean what who is the other guy who jumps around too much no not sadguru doesn't jump around he's a very calm calm guy ramdev yeah i mean he also does this uh, breathing in like uh, you know and all that right what are you doing actually what are you doing you cooling the brain actually you look at it you cooling the brain okay that's probably how when you are angry people say you take a deep breath okay when you have you tired take a deep breath even if nobody tells you the brain knows take a deep breath okay so then we got connected with this group and it's interesting so we did we had groups who did ema thermometry in people who were doing yoga prana pranayama yoga not uh, all that fantastic asanas uh, where they not themselves around and they know they cannot get out they need help to get out of it okay not those these are pranayama which means they breathe and when they breathe they found out that the basal part of the brain the temperature comes down is very very interesting extremely interesting and then there was this beautiful paper where people they they described that intubated patients their brain temperature higher or lower higher or lower why because this breathing doesn't take place it's called shunting effect go ahead google search it okay they they call it they call it the shunting for intubated patient the brain temperature was higher than the normal patients okay so then we propose that my nedagard and elif had already proposed that the cleaning part is already done by the g lymphatic system which is very closely related to the csf we also proposed that the cooling also is done by the csf so the brain's cooling and cleaning is done by csf 
Now, does it have implications? Yes. So when you have Varsha Robin space are uh, blocked, what happens to a computer when it superheats? Imagine, do you know about a small part in the computer which can conk it off? SMP is fan. The fan, if it's not working, the computer will conk off in, in minutes. Okay? You look at our shimmers. These are people who have less aquaporin for expression. And what happens to the Varsha Robin spaces? They are clamped with They clamped with? Well, they're amyloid. They've clamped, right? What is amyloid? What is amyloid? Yes, it's due to the heat shock, HSP, causing these proteins to curve up and then block the Varsha Robin spaces. The Varsha Robin spaces are blocked. And then these patients start developing degeneration of the brain. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, punch drunkenness. What happens? There's a lot of blood. And blood, what happens to blood? It degenerates to him. And what, what does him do? It blocks off the Varsha Robin space. Okay. The same kind of degeneration you find. So this, we figured out, could be an avenue, a new avenue to treating all this. Now, how can you treat all this? How can you open Varsha Robin space? A group in the United States, they put a bacteriophage into the olfactory epithelium of aquaporin-4 deleted rats. Aquaporin-4 deleted rats, they develop Alzheimer's very fast, as we told. They develop Alzheimer's very fast, pictures of Alzheimer's very fast. Of course, the rat is not going to forget where it put its keys and all that. It would forget, I mean, it would, the commands, or I don't know how, frankly, I don't know how they, they adjudge rats as being Alzheimer's. It's almost funny, you know. But these rats, they develop features of Alzheimer's according to the, the rat expert. And they put a bacteriophage into the olfactory epithelium of this rat. And voila, the rat's Alzheimer's features change back. Go look at it. Huh? Okay, I, I'm stopping. But you know how, what is working there? You know what does the bacteriophage do? It eats the bacterial cell wall, which is very similar to the things which is amyloid. So probably this bacteriophage is eating away the amyloid and opening up some of the Varsha Robin spaces which are closed primarily because aquaporin-4 was not expressed. We don't know. We don't have to put it into the olfactory epithelium. We could directly inject it intracisternally, these pages. And if you could do that, maybe it would be a cure for Alzheimer's. Who knows? And bacteriophages are not dangerous. They just eat bacteria. They don't really kill us. Okay. So we're looking at all these avenues. We, you should read this chapter. And uh, I mean, that's where the Sunasmi took us from a naive neurosurgical consultant in 2006 to where we are. It's, it's a long way to go. It's, an, uh, it's a journey which we enjoyed just because we kept an open mind. Okay. Because we didn't say, that doesn't work. Okay, or oh, this doesn't work. This is, you know, this is new. It's terrible. It's not good. My only message to you is, keep an open mind. And, you know, who knows what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sherian. Uh, we now have Professor Wang. He's the professor of neurosurgical department at Shansi the Academic uh, Hospital. He's also one of the pioneers in neurosurgery, has a lot of cases to show us today.
uh, good luck no every professor good luck to everyone uh, thank you uh, thank professor Terry uh, I'm Terry you meditation I'm from China this is my second time to uh, come here and uh, today my next title is uh, about the clinical research about uh, uh, this not me uh, actually free trauma have a uh, tra traditional uh, surgical therapy for about uh, 100 years but uh, in 100 years uh, there's no treatment why because uh, in the world uh, this uh, situation is uh, the same our resident uh, training completed uh, then go to bridge bridge tumor vascular school base and uh, there is no people to think about uh, brain trauma how to how to make uh, the patient good how to make patient uh, bad effect so actually we have many complications in our uh, brain trauma such as uh, 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 hydrocyte loss and uh, many uh, many complications and uh, when I read papers about how to cure these complications I find this doesn't and uh, find the Dr. Carey <laughs> uh, so I learn how to do the system and uh, why this this surgery is uh, very good so today I will show my content Extent has five parts at the uh, uh, overview, at the function over uh, identity of basal systems, at uh, about the uh, new theory about this uh, CSF circulation, at uh, some surgical procedure, and uh, my clinical data. Uh, this is a uh, uh, new overview about current status of a depressive craniectomy uh, and trauma brain injury because everyone uh, uh, as, uh, as you know we have uh, guideline brain trauma guideline there's uh, two famous uh, clinical trials one is uh, why is decro and uh, why is a rescue SAP these two uh, these two clinical trials show the, uh, uh, like like uh, Decra shows DC for severe and uh, refractory increase in, uh, in cranial hypertension is no use. DC for by broad DC no use, and DC for uh, for severe brain injury can reduce uh, the mortality rate but uh, associated is uh, more disability so there is a debate debate about uh, about uh, the, the the surgery so uh, we the indication for DC in variable TBI subtypes or is there any alternative therapy at uh, the also referred to our this not me and uh, this is the first time I see uh, uh, in paper overview referred to this not me so this is uh, a new paper This is very important. Uh, America Annual Science Scientific Meeting Abstract. This is uh, animal animal model. This also is uh, find paraventricular uh, uh, circulations also. Uh, Jeffrey Leaf and uh, Michael Nagarda uh, and uh, Nagarda. This also because uh, they find the glymphatic circulation in 2010. 
So this is their animal experiment. And uh, in this uh, in this experiment uh, uh, test, uh, they see after uh, DC can decrease positivity, decrease artery positivity, and uh, produce the impaired glymphatic CSF. So, uh, so they 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 can uh, they can induce glymphatic destruction, driver astronomic and glossy glossy. So they with with the demand for motor and the cognitive defect deficit. So recovery of glymphatic flow precedes reduced glossies and return normal neurologic function and the plastic accelerated recovery. So glymphatic dysfunction lead to the demand of CSF permanent communications and the poor outcome following depressed and current in animal model. This is a new evidence for dystopia. And uh, Shizami is a uh, normal technology that uh, incorporates uh, knowledge of uh, skull base and microsurgical micro surgery, surgery by opening the brain basal system to atmosphere pressure. The technique uh, could uh, decrease the intracranial pressure due to back shift of the CSF from swollen brain to the sister through the virtual open space. And uh, we will open the basal system. The function that we of the basal system, we use, we use high S system, uh, carotid uh, artery system, and the uh, liliquist. This part, high S system, carotid uh, artery system, and uh, we cut liliquist, liliquist map. And uh, this is Lily Christmas picture. Actually, Lily Christmas has three kind of variations of uh, at uh, this time, at this situation, we should cut uh, two layers. At uh, this situation, we only cut one layer. Uh, this is at the topic Lily Christmas member. And uh, we uh, cut uh, uh, dissension uh, liquid in here now. Uh, what is why we will dissection liquid member? I want to know what is the function of the liquid member. And this paper said liquid uh, the the liquid function because uh, this is uh, uh, Doctor Lot, America famous professor. And now is president of a viral institute, a viral neurological institute. So, uh, at this paper, they said, following SAH, the member of Liliquist often collects clotted blood and is taken at the inflamed. This cre creates locus of CSF in the prepotent and the interpartum in the particular sisters. Athletes find tissue of a laminar terminal fail to restore CSF from infrotentory and supratentory sister plant. As some people use uh, uh, laminar terminal uh, fenestration to reduce the hypercephalus after annulin, but it's uh, no use. Uh, Given this observation, we hypothesize that the penetration of the laminar terminals at the member we, we would restore communication between infratentory and the subtentory over CSF commerce. At the young case, more than 600 patients, the hydrocephalus only 3%. 
So they reduced greatly hydrocephalus. So it is very important to uh, penetration liquid map. This is a glymphatic system. This is Dr. Elif, two sound time. This is a very famous finding. So they find the perivascular pathway, facility CSF, CSF flow through the pre pericamer. And uh, this uh, system, most uh, part of the uh, uh, function is in sleep. Like uh, Dr. Terry uh, tell us. So uh, this is a new finding. And uh, that, that uh, is an uh, animal experiment. This is a human. This is a human, human brain. This paper is about uh, 50, 50 healthy participants. So they provide uh, the evidence that in human brain, there is also have glymphatic uh, transporter process. So this is our now realized CSF circulation. And uh, from lateral ventricle, through the ventricle, fourth ventricle, to sister, to venous system, this is the one way. And uh, from sister to brick pericema, this is two way. So this is our systemic theory. And uh, at this time, Dr. Larry, CSF is edema because in subacronoid phase, uh, traumatic subacronoid hemorrhage, and this uh, sister's pressure is high. Then, result in shift of CS from this to precurricum through pervascular spaces, volume. Uh, pressure gradient at the result and increase of what kind of breed. This mechanism of a breed volume term as uh, CF, CSF shift edema. And uh, our surgery is like this. We can, in operation, we can suction CSF. Then after surgery, we can drainage for one week. So we can reduce the pre edema. Uh, surgery procedure is uh, like this. Uh, we do not need a, a bigger flap, only this is enough. And we, we need to flap this uh, sphenoid crest. And uh, we use microscope. So we cut the chiasma sister and the uh, carotid artery sister. And cut the liquid member. After surgery, when pre relax, we will put a tube drainage for one week. This is uh, our clinical data, uh, this retrospective research. Uh, took place the effect of a dystotomy or traumatic brain injury. We chose 30, uh, 46 patients from 2007 May at uh, this year's September in our medical center. We divide into six on the group, 23 cases. Two group, that is non six on the group, 23 cases. Uh, this is outcome measures, Glasgow comma score at admission at the discharge. 
because from last year we have ICP monitor. So uh, our measures, our patient data time is not long, only in hospital. And uh, compressor ICP over these two groups, pre-operation, the end of operation, and the post-operation in one week. So these three time point, we can record the patient's ICP. At the post-operation, have automatic solution, less of a mechanical ventilation, less of a stay in neural intensive care, and less of a stay in hospital, infection, mortality between two groups. These are our measures, outcome measures. This is uh, two groups, pre-operation clinical data. There is no difference no st statistical difference. That is, these two groups can compare. And uh, before, this is the pre operative ICP, there is no stati statistical difference. And uh, after ICP, after surgery, post surgery, post operation, this ICP in cystostomy with the two group, there is a difference. That is, in the group, we get ICP more low. This is one week ICP treating. This is a systemic group. This is a conventional surgery group. There is no difference. There is no statistical difference, which is uh, below 20 millimeter Hg. Actually, but uh, at this system uh, group, we used uh, less monitor, less uh, hyperosmetic solutions, such as monitor at the uh, hyperosmetic automatic uh, uh, solution, solid. Uh, this is a post-operation hypothematic solution, less of a mechanical ventilation, less of a stay in neural intensive care, and less of a stay in hospital between two groups. And the uh, hypothematic solution is uh, different because in this group, we use mandatory less. But uh, the mechanical vet ventilation at the level of stay in ICU is the have no difference. Why? Actually, they have, they have difference. Because in our uh, own ICU set, we should regularly use uh, sanitation after surgery. Sanitation for one week in severe brain injury. So these two measures have no difference. But uh, let's see in hospital, this is uh, P value is uh, 0 0.04. There is difference. That is, she thought we can short the stay in hospital. This is the first of three clinical data between two groups. De Depressive Ukrainian academy rate, the me is 56.5, and the group, group is 991%. Mortality rate, this is 30%, this is 26%, and the infection rate, this is one, this real. So, she thought me can reduce the depressive current action rate and uh, reduce the mortality rate. This is uh, GCS score at discharge between two groups. This discharge GCS system group and the crew group, there is a difference. So, 
So you don't group can improve the GCS at discharge. This is our approach. So you don't mean replace a valuable option for the treatment of choice in severe TBI. This surgical approach is giving acceptance in many centers worldwide. And uh, it applies this technique and report more outcomes. It could prove the uh, promise in surgical technique by itself or as a complement to depressive cranial action. Like an apparent sunset, a uh, system you will sweep along the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Wang. We now have Dr. Anila Darbar. She is the Professor of Neurosurgery at Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, Program Director of the Neurosurgical Residency Training Program. And uh, she is here with us, one of the uh, President of the Women in Neurosurgery of Pakistan. She is presenting about the eyebrow technique. Um, since we're setting up, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Ipe and Hira, both of uh, you, to invite me to the Noble Institute and uh, letting me present. And um, uh, I'm just going to give you a little small story of how um, I wanted to do the minimally invasive uh, approaches and uh, how it changed my life. So when I was a resident and uh, there was this uh, girl who had an interior skull based tumor and who had very long hair. And uh, in my institute used to like, um, before the surgery, the day before, everybody have to go and shave the hair. Like, you know, the resident would go and shave so that it's ready for the next day. And uh, I remember that uh, this girl was very adamant that she didn't want to shave her hair. And um, she wouldn't let the boys touch her. So they asked me to go and convince her to get her hair shaved. And she reluctantly did. And uh, she was um, very sad and her surgery went well. But uh, what happened after surgery that a uh, couple of her friends also shaved their own heads just for the sisterhood support. So um, I was uh, very touched by this small uh, event that had happened. And uh, I started looking for you know, somebody who can coach me to do procedures in which you don't have to do hair shaving, uh, especially for girls, especially for really children and very young girls who, you know, there's a lot of their personality attached to the looks, you know. So um, I went to Dr. Charlie Teo, who I uh, did my fellowship with in endoscopic and minimally invasive. And he was the one who actually taught me how to do an eyebrow approach. And I'm very thankful to him. Uh, he's a great surgeon. And uh, so this talk is dedicated to Dr. Charlie Teo. Okay, so I will be talking about uh, this approach, which is very small, minimally invasive and through the eyebrow. Um, you know, for the medical students, it's just a general idea that, you know, what are the different routes? I mean, neurosurgery, the first thing that comes into mind that, okay, somebody is going to open my head and uh, there are going to be big defects. Uh, that idea is slowly, of course, changing now. Uh, near, the lot of neurosurgery that is practiced minimally invasive fashion or interventional through different other kind of procedures. So not all neurosurgery is about doing big incisions and big openings and big defects. So the idea that I want to leave with you with is the surgery. Uh, this is a place I work at the Al Khan University Hospital, and uh, I uh, invite any medical student who want to come and do an elective in neurosurgery, 
we have a faculty of eight and we do almost all kind of neurosurgeries, including functional neurosurgery, spine, tumors. We have fellowship program. So any student who is interested, please contact me later and can come and do an elective with us uh, at Aachen, Karachi. So, um, Dr. Sanjeev actually showed you this picture before. And these are the different routes that you can come and take. And I'm not going to go through names because it's just too much information for you. But just a general visual idea that how can you actually enter into this part of the brain through this different approaches. This is also one approach through the nose. So instead of coming from here, you can also reach this area through putting a little endoscope and reaching quite a bit of an area almost from here, which is we call as anterior skull base to this, which we call as the cellar area and the back of the clavicle area. You can actually approach almost any pathology from here to here through a little of course, need scopes are a different angle, so the view is not straight, but you can look up, you can look sideways, you can look down. So for subfrontal approaches, I am not going to go through this because I, I think it's probably, um, you won't be able to understand all this information. But what I'm going to go through is just have a visual about uh, the kind of cases we do in neurosurgery, okay? So these kind of big tumors we do through different approaches. For this one is the terional. We also do this kind of uh, big tumors in the skull base. The approach is septemporal. And then this is a sort of a septemporal approach. And we also do, which is called a transpenoidal through the nose and remove these kind of lesions out from there. Now, can any medical student tell me what, uh, what is this? Any idea? Since we are in what area? Hmm? What is this little structure there? And this little structure right there. Yeah? Any gu guesses? Pituitary gland. And fantastic. And what is this little area called? This one is the pituitary stalk, right? So very, very, very small kidney bean shaped organ, but extremely important since all the hormones that we use in our, um, unfortunately we don't, I think, I think we'll go through it. That's enough. Um, all the hormones that we have in our body are actually uh, produced and moved through the system throughout our body. So extremely important area. So just a little history of the eyebrow approach. And started in 84 uh, by Jane and Kaplan. 87, Al Mafti did his first description. These are all famous neurosurgeons, and as you're going to go through neurosurgery, you will know all these names who are who actually started this approach. So basically, I can say it started in 84, a little evolved in 87. In 90s, it was much more evolved, started to use by many neurosurgeons in the world. And in 1988, Dr. Charles Perneski actually presented the first big series. So most of the Eyebrow approach or minimally invasive approach, Perneski is supposed to be the master for doing those kind of approaches. And most of us have actually learned through his technique. So this is the approach that we are going to talk about. And this is the incision usually that we do. And um, so you don't have to go through all this. Uh, the only thing is that uh, what you have to understand is that you can use an endoscope in this case. You can use a microscope, but an endoscope actually gives, also gives a fantastic view. And I will show you some of the views. Okay. 
so what are the indications these are different kind of tumors you would not know but doesn't matter but tumors is one indication the other indication is aneurysms but aneurysms through this small opening has to be done only by the expert because uh, the problem is the proximal control of the vessels are not there all the time so only as the expert usually do it i don't do aneurysms through this approach i only do tumors but i'm not sure uh, I, if you do anybody does aneurysms through this approach So some of the contraindication for this approach is that it shouldn't be so low because otherwise you won't be able to reach it. And uh, so when you make the, sorry, yeah. So your incision should be big enough that you should be able to open your bipolar. If you are unable to do that, then you can't go inside and coagulate the blood vessels in case there's some bleeding inside happens. So that's what you have to make sure. What you do after is that you make a small burr right there using a burr. And this is just, again, going through the images so that, you know, it's like pictures are worth a thousand words. So I don't want to tell you in a lecture form. I'm just showing the pictures so you can remember. And then you take a little drill and you drill out the bone. So now the drilling is complete and you take this bone off. Once you take the bone off, sorry, there's another picture there. This is usually the size of the bone that you would have. Once the bone is off, this is how it looks like. What we usually do is we usually even drill this little edge so it gives us a good view. And this is usually how the incision looks like, usually the smaller incision. So, sorry, don't come back again. And once you open the dura, then you would see the brain. And this is the angle where you have to go through. So when you enter it, this is the first thing that you see. And these pictures are taken from Perneski's book. So I just want to let you know. And this is, this is the angle that you see. So you see, what is this? What you're seeing here? Any guesses? So you come in from here. So what is underneath? It's your eye, right? So what would you see? The optic nerve. Okay, so this is the optic nerve on one side. This is the optic nerve on the other side. This is almost the chiasm. This area, this is the area which we call as lamina terminalis. And then this is the structure where you would see what is this? Besides the eye nerve, we have gone through a bit of anatomy before. This is the internal carotid artery. So this is the first view usually you get. Okay, and then when you go further, you can go deeper down on this area. You can go deeper down in this area. These are the different corridors that the neurosurgeon use to reach different parts of the brain. And then you close and you see how small this is. You have to have a watertight closure. If you can't, you can use other things. Then you put a little plate and then you put the bone back. Now I'm going to show you a video. How do I end it? Video is not in sound, but I can show you. So this is right from the beginning to the end. You can see. So now we have removed the bone. We have removed the dura, we have stacked the dura up. This is the frontal lobe, of course, the base of the frontal lobe, because we're just right up here. And then you go just in front of the frontal lobe, down all the way. And the first thing, of course, you will see is what? Optic, yes, that is so the first structure that you will see, right? Actually, you may see olfactory now, too, if you're passing through the, uh, the, the frontal lobe. But here you're starting to see the optic, right? And then these are some of the arachnoid membranes that we have to cut down to see the carotid and to just clear up the view. And if you go a little lateral, so these approaches can be done a little medially in the center. Laterally, you can even remove a little bit of the orbit 
you can this is the sylvian fissure this is a lateral fissure we have you can even open a little bit of this you can get some space depending what kind of tumor you are doing and where you are trying to reach you may not have to do this every single time especially if you are doing a more medial approach you don't even have to go but a more lateral approach you would be able to this is going to fast forward a little bit this is all arachnoid membranes that you have to cut through this is the optic again you have to be really careful because even these tiny vessels that you see you try to preserve them because even these tiny perforators can give you blindness if you are careless about it and there's a carotid right there and then this is the optical carotid window that i said there are several windows out there one of them is this and you can reach actually deep down into the interior part of the brain stem where the cerebral peduncles are through this corridor between these two important structures so as we are going down here is the basilar artery over there and of course the the cerebral peduncular part of the brain stem so from here you can actually reach quite back into the brain Now again, depending on the pathology and the angle that you are going to. The importance of chiasm is very important when you have to understand what kind of route you have to take. Sometimes you can take this route. Sometimes you can have to take the nasal route. Sometimes you have to take the lateral route. and for you you have to understand what's going to come in your way right so if this is your chiasm then this is a better route to take because you won't be able to reach through that route but if your chiasm is here and there's an angle you can actually come through this so again there's a lot of learning that happens over time to understand what routes you have to take and a lot of learning comes from your seniors and your teachers who actually teach you how to how which approach is a better approach so this is one example of an arbra craniotomy and again as i said that there's sometimes you can't use this approach not because it's going too lateral and too inferior you won't be able to reach it another example and this is how the eyebrow craniotomy looks like and in 6 months time even this little scar is even not visible some of the complication that the most common complication that happens is the frontalis palsy and uh, this usually happens it is temporary in few months it usually subsides so you won't be able to lift up your eyebrow here you won't be able to see this the frontalis palsy permanent is, is rare infection can happen if you enter into the sinus frontal sinus here if you enter into the sinus you have to make sure that you know uh, you take the measures to make sure that the infection doesn't happen uh and uh, uh the last bit i just want to show you some of the pictures of different routes you can take as i said you can do the the mid type one which is here or you can use the lateral one that i spoke to you about now this replaces this kind of an incision okay so instead of going a mini perioneal you can also go a little lateral and do this now again it's the choice of the surgeon you know and what is comfortable it's not that one is good or one is bad it's what you are most comfortable with then you can do a big medial and this replaces this big incision that you don't have to do okay because if your lesion sometimes is sitting here we actually sometimes make this huge craniotomy which you don't need it and you can actually make a small incision transciliary which means inside the eyebrow and can do that or sometimes you can even remove a bit of your orbit along with this if you have to reach some eye pathology okay again depending on pathology 
and your training you choose which is the right approach for this. But these are several different indication of doing an eyebrow differently. And in my conclusion, so the eyebrow is also called as a supraorbital approach. It is safe, it's effective, it's minimally invasive, and you can remove any kind of tumor which is from the eye all the way into the cella. And for clipping aneurysm, I would say only in the expert hands. And the major limitations are if, it's, if you are involved in the cavernous sinus, then don't go because there's too much bleeding and the, the opening is very small. Um, but tumor of the anterior cranial fossa can be done, but not the one that extends into the cavernous sinus. If you have a small lesion in the interpeduncular area, not a large one, interpeduncular area is where the brain stem is between the two cerebral peduncles. You can reach for a small lesion, but not for a large lesion, not for a vascular lesion, but some small lesion that you can. You can also access this minimally invasive. Thank you very much. And um, I am going to uh, just end by saying that um, I would really like, I'm a big proponent of women in neurosurgery, and I would like more females to join neurosurgery um, to increase the critical mass numbers. And uh, like we say, there's a saying that behind every man, there's a woman. For women in neurosurgery, behind every woman neurosurgeon, there's always a man. So, so I want to uh, request all the neurosurgeons out here that please do promote, do help the women to go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ed.
The participants are requested to wait. You will get your lunch boxes outside.
Hello, I'm, oh, Tom. Yeah, I'm just having a problems here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Hello, I can't hear you. Okay, let me let me type here. Okay, I can hear you. Yeah, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <coughs> yes. Yes, hello. Hello.